influences. Uh, Rinko Kawauchi, Shumei Tomatsu, Alex Soph. I'm Heidi Cannon and I'm a photographer from Colchester and I am also a bookmaker as well. Is there one particular photograph that is your proudest piece of work? It was about leaving a very abusive relationship and how I used Buddhist philosophies to heal from that. The relationship was mostly based in London, so it's using that to revisit every space I'd been to with this person and remake the memories to happy ones or calm moments. Not all photos have to have a meaning behind them, but mine tend to have kind of something that I'm either going through or something I'm trying to like reflect through the imagery. And anyone can do it. How did you get started in photography? What was it that sparked your interest? So when I was a child, I always used to have a, a mini digital Canon camera, which I always brought around with me wherever I went. And I used to just take pictures of just anything I saw. Mostly I took pictures of my feet to be able of like from above, <laughs> just classic shoes, just wherever I went. Um, but as I went into secondary school, luckily my secondary school had a photography department, which was uh, kits it out of like a, a dark room as well so we had that kind of opportunity which I'm very grateful for because not many other like schools had that um, so it started to kind of build up from there then I went to sixth form and I carried on doing it then I had about two years where I just went traveling around Europe for a while but I took uh, cam uh, two cameras with me the whole time um, and just kind of documented what I was doing so from there, I just realized that I'd always had this kind of presence of having cameras with me and taking photos. So it started there. Then I went to university and I kind of tried to refine my skill a bit more because I'd just been doing it by myself and just kind of having fun with it. So I wanted to be more, more like professional with it. So, yeah. Oh, wicked. Yeah. What did your parents think? Um, they've always been very supportive of it, to be honest. Um my uh, parents are both quite artistic. Like my dad, he quite enjoyed photography when he was young as well. So he's always been very supportive of it. And my mum, she uh, used to go to art school and she was a printer for a while. So she's always been very arty as well. So yeah, I think they're more interested by what I make and how I kind of perceive the world. So I guess it's interesting for them. <laughs> no, that's wicked. So what are you doing now? You've left uni. So I'm on the way to moving to Japan um, to teach English out there, but I'm still working my photography alongside that. So I've been traveling to South Korea and Japan quite often just to kind of see how I like both countries and it's amazing out there. So yeah, I want to go back. <laughs> like I've never actually been abroad. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, no, you I've, must. I've, I'm still yet to get a passport. Oh, no. So, <laughs> you have yeah. to do it. It's so worth it. Yeah. Although once you start, it's very addictive and you can't really stop. <laughs> yeah, and I, for for whatever reason, I never got took as a as a kid. Oh, so okay, that's, yeah. I've just mm. never, I've never done it. Yeah, but no, it would be wicked to to get out of the UK. Yeah, a little bit. Be a relief. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you said you were going to go and teach English. Yeah. In Japan. So there's a it's a program called the Japanese Exchange Teaching Program. And so it's four year contract and you basically get sent out there to anywhere in Japan. You can't really have a choice. So I think that's what puts some people off because you could literally be living on like an island outside of Japan. But it's never really scared me that much. So that's just something I want to do. So oh, Wicked. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Mm. I've also I also didn't pass my English exam. So oh, that, okay. <laughs> that would not qualify me. To, to Although all you need is a degree. Really? That's, that's all you need. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, it's the same for South Korea as well. Obviously, you've got to have a passion in teaching because it'll be pretty draining if you didn't enjoy teaching and then you had to teach for a year. So. Oh wow. But yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> so you, you can you speak Japanese? A small bit. I'm currently studying it. Um, so I'm starting actual lessons because I've been doing like self study, but I've got to a point where I'm like, I actually need a teacher to help me with this because it's very hard, but it's quite fun. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can, ba I can barely <laughs> speak English, to be honest, so. I think me too sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, what, do you have any sort of influences when it comes to 
photography. Yeah, because um, the whole kind of Japan thing is because of my influences. Um, mainly are like Japanese photographers, filmmakers, uh, literature as well. Um, my uni degree project was mostly based on kind of inspiration I had through like several Japanese writers um, and kind of like the history as well. Because my dissertation was, I can't remember its title now, it was like post-war history and how it affected uh, Japanese creators. So it was quite intense, but I got yeah. there. So, but um, yeah, I've just always been very interested in Japanese culture as a whole and learning more about it and kind of including that in my photography and my style. Yeah. Wicked. So what is it that you like to photograph the most? On your Instagram, there's a lot of yeah. street yeah. photography. I would say it kind of has always been the same for me, like ever since I was a child and I just took pictures of like random things that interested me. And I feel like that didn't really fade. Like, I think when I first began university, I was very, like, I tried to fit into that sort of university mold. You have to do this to get the certain marks. So then I kind of strayed away from what I loved about photography a bit in first and second year. And obviously it was the COVID years as well. So it was very hard to kind of keep up something you loved when all that was happening at the same time, especially like, creative courses yeah it was just such a struggle like you would have known because it's like how am I supposed to make art when I don't really know what I'm meant to be doing right now um so yeah it's always just been things that interest me things that just look nice I know that's quite <laughs> a basic thing to say but I just enjoy kind of seeing what surrounds me and just taking photos of that so. yeah no absolutely mm. so I happen to know that you did quite well I at uni did, yes. <laughs> what can you sort of break down mm. what what that was like yeah. your experience for uni because there's a, a kind of a hot topic of mm. any creative I mean, you know in, in I mean I'm in sort of videography mm. um and the hot topic is mm. going to uni or film school mm. versus just getting experience in the workplace yeah. and you've got industry heavyweights mm. saying that you don't need film school you don't yeah. need arts you don't need an arts degree mm. um how did you find doing a creative subject um as a as a degree yeah well for myself I've always kind of enjoyed studying reading things like that so I can see that part of going to uni and doing an art subject is very hard because you're used to just kind of creating work and not having this whole kind of academic side to it. So dissertation, I think, is a big struggle for a lot of creative people because you're kind of made to do this 10,000 word um, essay about anything, which I think is very hard, especially when you have other degrees where there's a specific subject so you know what you're writing about so it was like when you see like creative course dissertations it's always very interesting because no one does the same thing it's always just very varied um but I do agree with the fact that I don't think university is necessary for a creative course but I think it can be beneficial like if I didn't go to university there was certain aspects of my work that would not be as refined as they are now and even like creating ideas and things like I needed to have my lecturers kind of advice and understanding criticism, I think is very important as well. When I first started uni, I remember I got like my first critique and I was so upset by it because my whole life has been, oh, I've been nice, like I'm good at photography. And then it was just like, oh, I've just been like destroyed in front of the whole class. <laughs> but I feel like that kind of helps because in the industry, you're going to have so many people that are so brutal to you about your work. So it's kind of getting that thick skin which is kind of needed with like creativity because you're gonna have people that hate your work like there's people that don't like my work they just say oh the blurry photos and it's like yeah okay <laughs> that's your opinion but all right so I think it does help in that aspect but I don't think it's necessary for everyone like, I've really enjoyed university and I just enjoy studying quite a lot so I've always been quite like a workaholic so I need like multiple things happening at once so yeah so it's not cool. necessary for everyone so what was the teachers and but the teaching style like? How did you find it? Um, so we had like three uh, 
lecturers um, and then one that was for like dissertation. But the three main ones for, for photography, they're all very like different from each other. So I feel like that worked quite well. Like one was a bit harsher. So he was kind of best to go to for like critiques because you know that he's going to strip down your work and make you explain everything. Because when I first started my degree, I came up with like my idea for my project. Um, but then I had to switch lecturers because um, of uh, other issues. Um, but he kind of was completely different to the other lecturer I had before. So at first I was a bit like, oh, I'm a bit scared now because I don't know what my project's really about because it started off as something, but I realised it was actually about something else. Um, so it was kind of understanding that development, that creative like process kind of goes through, like you'd probably know yourself. It just kind of changes as you're doing it. And I think it was kind of like embracing that as well because at first it's kind of scary to like watch your project evolve. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Mm. Yeah, no, I had a, we had a lecturer mm. called Piers mm. and um, he was sort of like, he was sort of like the music teacher from Whiplash. Oh God, so, yeah. <laughs> so it was like, yeah, everybody was like shaking in their shoes when it came to one-on-one yeah. -on -one feedback. Mm. So I was like, oh God. Because yeah. I used to be like that with one of them, but now we're just really close. Like I still speak to all the lecturers outside uni now. Like if I need advice, then I ask them, like meet up for coffee sometimes. So it's kind of oh, nice. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, yeah, <laughs> that's cool. So, um, with your film photography, mm. um, how do you how do you feel about um, sort of sort of the the digital aspect of photography? I mean, mm. I actually had an interview mm. for. The course that you did oh okay um and there was it was sort of it was sort of an insecurity of mine mm. I didn't know I had yeah when I went to the interview mm. and I brought my laptop along with me yeah with a file of all of my stuff yeah and I walked into the room where all the other like candidates mm. I guess were all kind of sat around mm. and everybody had was, folders yeah. with film photography and mm. I was sort of sat there like oh I don't know if yeah. I like belong mm. if I feel like I belong here or yeah. not because I'm big on like basically big on really commercial yeah. work mm. um automotive photography yeah, is like a, like a big thing for me mm. um so yeah I suppose uh, how do you feel about film mm. photography and digital photography um I would say film photography is very good for understanding how cameras work, which then can benefit you, you in like digital like cameras. Because I've always had like a digital camera alongside my film camera, and like sometimes when I want to kind of work things out for my film camera, I'll actually use the digital one because then it will just tell me all the answers basically. So it's kind of good for like cheating in that way. Um, but I feel like it's definitely based on style like there's a certain style you can get from film that you can't get from digital like you can try and edit it but it's always kind of obvious like there's been times where I'm like oh I can't afford to buy film right now I'll try and like make it look like I've done it with my digital camera and it just does not look the same mm. but I think it can work sometimes but I feel like digital is it's definitely very good like especially now like at uni I don't know if you saw them they had these Fuji cameras and I think they cost like 40 grand like they're so expensive yeah but the photos you got from those were insane like it looked better than real life and I just don't know how that's <laughs> physically possible but they were amazing um so I feel like it's definitely based on style but I feel like studying a bit of film will help benefit digital and like jumping from one to the other is always like I feel like some people think, okay, I'm a photographer, but I only do digital. It's like a very like like common mindset. Like a lot of my friends are like, oh, I only shoot and film. And it's like, okay, but you can do like digital sometimes. So I feel like it's it's a personal thing, I think, as well. Because like I was going to go to Norwich Uni originally, <coughs> but they didn't actually have a dark room. So instantly I was like, oh. Here, I'm sorry. Oh. Like, I'd like to go to that university because loads of people I know that have gone there have got like amazing photography, and then they still use film as well. 
but it's just they didn't have the same kind of you wouldn't gain the same skill set as what I kind of did at university just because we had all the supplies you needed yeah mm. no, that makes sense mm. so in terms of the specs mm. like by specs I mean the equipment yeah what can you break that down in mm. terms of the cameras that you use yeah. the focal the, the lenses the focal focal yeah. lengths that you like to use um so my actual main cameras uh people always laugh at because i use a diana mini and they're like these tiny little i should have brought it with me these tiny little boxes and my one's blue and it's glittery right and it looks like a toy camera like most times if i go out and shoot with it people are like is that an actual camera i'm like <laughs> yeah it is because it looks like a little toy so that's like used for lomography so it's kind of very basic like the settings on the front are like you have a two meter setting five and then infinity and then sunny or cloudy um, right. iso so you're just very limited <laughs> but i think that's what i enjoy about it because you never know what the photo will look like at the end because my whole uh, university degree project was about that because it was inspired by buddhist ideology and shintoism so that's all about accepting life as it comes and you never know what's going to happen and embracing kind of the imperfect. So like my photos, some of them were like really bleached or just really underexposed. Um, but I kind of enjoyed that kind of, it was like the serendipity of the photo. Like you don't know what's going to happen and just kind of accepting it for what it is. So that's kind of like my main camera I use. I do have a Canon digital one, but, um, I use it sometimes. I used it when I went to Japan just because I was mainly, I didn't take as many photos I, as I wanted to when I went to Japan yeah. just because I was so like engrossed in what was happening because it's a very busy place because I went to Tokyo. So it was just quite overwhelming, but in like a good way. Yeah. Because it's like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. So I was kind of very like just aware of what was happening around me rather than taking photos. So that's why I use my digital because it's a lot faster in that sense um then i've got a pentax p30 which is my just classic uh, 35 mil one i've used that for years and it's just always been great and then what else do i use i do have another diana camera another lomography but that's for 120 film um i'm using that in my current project because i've never experimented using 120 before if i have it's just with like a hasselblad or Oh, wicked. So if you could break down sort of mm. your style, mm. um, if you could break down like if there's like a p particular photographer, like a top mm. three or a top five oh, okay. um, that you had to, mm. that, you, that, you, that you've had to say if mm. someone, you know, yeah. to recommend someone look at their work, okay. what would they be? My, I say my top photographer is probably Rinko Kawauchi. And she's like a Japanese photographer that takes photos in like a way that I want to. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
Um, he's like a classic. I feel like most photography students will probably be sick of his name. Alex Sof. For me, photography has always been this physical act. It's carrying this big box out into the world and trying to capture this image on this sheet of film, this substance that, I, that has to be developed. Like he did uh, a road trip across the whole of America and just took photos along the way. And I kind of used him as inspiration when I went to Europe. Um, I just wanted to have the same kind of looking at what was around me and then capturing kind of what I enjoyed. Um, so yeah, so he's my second favorite. And then Shomei Tomatsu, I'd say would be my third. Um, he was a post-war um, photographer in Japan and captured kind of what was happening during that time from like a young person's perspective, because he really kind of influenced my dissertation a lot, because I got a lot of photos from his kind of era, and then just kind of wrote about them and backed them up with loads of other information. So, but he works mainly with black and white, thirty-five mil, very rough looking, because he worked alongside Dado Moriyama, who was another photographer that was in that kind of generation. They just produced these like amazing photos that showed kind of how Japan was really changing from before the war to after the Americans occupied it and left. So, yeah. Oh, wicked. Yeah. So how did you how did you find doing the dissertation anyways? I weirdly enjoyed it. And most of my friends hate me for saying that because I, I think in the summer, I kind of thought of an idea and I absolutely hated it. And then I was like, okay, I'm just going to write about what I enjoy, even though it's completely random, like, everyone else was kind of doing things we'd studied in class and so I was like I kind of want to do something different and something that I'm actually interested in so that's why I kind of looked at Japanese history and how I could com like combine that with my photography and also I spoke about film within it as well um so yeah it was a lot of hard work but I feel like if you kept a schedule then it was okay <laughs> If you kind of got behind on it, then it just definitely got really stressful for people. Um, but I weirdly enjoyed it as much as I hate. I <laughs> kind of like, That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> usually if you're creative, yeah. it's us usually it's like the, the academic side that yeah. <laughs> suffers. Mm. But no, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah no, I had a, I had a schedule mm. where I was like, I'll do a thousand words a day yeah. and I'll just kind of do that but mm. I can't, yeah that I found that super super yeah. difficult because I think I did a draft in November and I just wrote 8,000 words then and then I just kind of deleted things added things each week and then just kept reading for it over and over and then I got my teachers just to constantly read I was like is this okay so it was a lot of hard work I feel like I was very burnt out by the end of yeah. third year it took me probably like a year I feel like now I feel fine after uni. <laughs> you have PTSD. Yeah, I do. <laughs> cool. So is there is there one particular piece of work or one particular photograph that you is sort of your your proudest uh, <gasps> your proudest piece of work? Oh, that's hard. I feel like my uni project was definitely definitely my favorite because um, it's. The project, I'll explain what the project is about before I start sure. talking about the photo. Um, so it was about um, leaving like a very abusive relationship and how I used Buddhist philosophies to heal from that. And so the, the relationship was mostly based in London, but they actually lived in the US. So it was like a long distance. So we would always meet up in London. So I created a kind of almost like a a journey through London to show all the locations I'd visited with that person and how kind of it altered my perspective on the city. Like I ended up hating London after I ended the relationship just because it reminded me of that person. So the book was about using these Buddhist philosophies of like not blame myself, accepting that the past has happened and everything continues. Um, so it's using that to kind of revisit every space I'd been to with this person and remake the memories to happy ones or like calm moments. So the whole book was about that. So I think my favorite photo would have to be 
the last photo shoot I did was during the springtime, so all the cherry blossom was out in London. And so I took pictures of all of these like cherry blossoms and there was just one photo and it was just like it kind of summarised that I'd kind of moved on from that really dark part of my life because the cherry blossom is kind of, it's supposed to show you the transience of life and how things move on. So there was just one photo and I was like, yeah, that's it. I recovered from that situation. So Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Do you mind talking a little bit about... Mm. You said you you were in a relationship. Mm. Yeah, it was just, it wasn't a very good one. It was just a, a very toxic situation. Um, I'm a bit of a people pleaser, which I learned throughout the relationship. So, um, yeah, so it was just, it was a very hard situation. So I feel like using photography to then heal from that was something that was very special to kind of use and get through that. Because I feel like, a lot of female photographers I noticed had had like past experiences of documenting like really bad moments in their life and making something beautiful out of them. Like I hadn't seen that, like some male photographers may do that, but I feel like as a woman, I wanted to see all these female artists and how they kind of reflected on like bad experiences as a woman and how it kind of affected their own kind of sense of self as well. Because I feel like when you're in that situation, you don't, you're trying to help the other person, even if they're not helping you. So it was kind of like, after that, I felt very drained. So it was kind of like recovering my personality back and just being more fun again. <laughs> so, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds, sounds dark, but it, yeah. sound, it, sound, yeah, it sounds like you've really managed to turn it into something mm. more positive yeah because it went great. on for three years um the relationship but I just suddenly ended it. I was like I've had enough I'm gonna get out of this so I feel like the hardest part of abusive relationships is leaving them because when you're in them you're just like oh it's probably just me because obviously yeah. gaslighting happens and all this yeah stuff. yeah and then once you leave you're like I was stupid but also no you weren't because it's just hard to get out once you're in one so the map on the front was the kind of uh, journey that I described. So this was the last route I took when I saw my ex-boyfriend. Uh, so I think it's London Liverpool Street to Gatwick Airport. So it was oh. the final time I saw him. So that's kind of why I've done it in this kind of dark colour. And then this gold um, that I used was to kind of show all the places that I then visited without him and kind of enjoyed and explored and kind of created new life from those moments. So it was kind of to explore that. And I used Japanese book binding to, which is this kind of effect. Um, all the papers also from Japan, which cost me a lot, <laughs> but right. it, was, it was worth it. Um, does it feel different? <laughs> it does. Does it? Is it thicker? <laughs> yeah, so it's made of bamboo. So this bit's rice paper. Uh, yeah, it's made of bamboo, so it's a lot thicker and absorbs the ink. So uh, then it looks a bit like watercolour. And so also I had some rice paper inserts of the locations that I walked around. So I kind of kept on, I think it was like a thing on Apple Maps and it can show where you've walked. Right. So I just basically traced those lines of the streets I went down. And then I put alongside all the places I went to just to kind of show those kind of happier moments from what was before originally i did put the black line throughout the whole book and then slowly fade it out but then i was a bit like i actually don't like that so yeah. i just completely removed it um so yeah it's just kind of documented the seasons i tried to kind of do it in a, a color order but it's not too noticeable um so then i kind of switched it to just my journey from beginning to end because I thought that kind of made more sense with the actual book and yeah I also I don't know if it's got oh yeah I included a, a ginkgo leaf because the project is called Higabana and ginkgo leaves which right. is actually about the tattoo I've got on my back because it's basically those plants but I got that tattoo as a kind of sign that I'd kind of survives those bad moments because ginkgo trees i was like weirdly inspired by them because in japan there's two famous ginkgo trees in hiroshima 
who just survived the nuclear blast completely and they're still growing till today. And then the flower in the middle, which is the Higginbana, that's a uh, spider lily. It's used quite commonly in like anime and stuff. You always see it when something new is going to happen. All right. So um, I got that in the center. So, but that's kind of why I included the ginkgo leaf just to show like the element of surviving like a bad moment and something horrible that's happened. So yeah. And also the cloth was also from Japan. But this is also relating to Japanese ideology about things passing because it's meant to show like the ebbing tides. I think it's okay. what your name is. Interesting. So, yeah. But no. that's that's my degree project. <laughs> no, that's that's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> did you was making a book part of the assignment, or did you go just go ahead and? We did have a book binding class you could join, but right. it wasn't really like part of it, like. You didn't have to, because originally it was only going to be, I think, 20 pages, but I think it's actually 40 in the end. Wow. So <laughs> it's because I took quite a lot of photos, and a lot of them I feel like I wanted to include, because I think I, I don't know how many photos I took in total. I hate to think, to be honest. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, awesome. Mm. Do you ever still talk to your no. ex-partner? No. no. <laughs> I was tempted to like send them the book and be like, was about you but then I was like nah I can't <laughs> he uh, tries to speak to me but uh, goodbye <laughs> that's, fair, that's fair enough yeah <laughs> <laughs> do you find that do you find that those negative mm. those, those sort of negative um situations mm. do you find it as kind of almost like rocket fuel for your creative I would say stuff? so yeah I know there's the whole like cringy thing was oh it's pain or something or like artist yeah. it's like the classic like pained artist like persona isn't it yeah but I feel like it for myself I feel like it has like most of my successful projects I've used something that I'm kind of like emotionally connected to like my current one it's um about moving away from Colchester my hometown which I used to really hate to be honest because I feel like you always hate your hometown and Colchester has been voted I think the most miserable place in the UK oh really yeah <laughs> I was like oh my god <laughs> so it's all about kind of like giving thanks to a place that I have like a lot of negative memories connected to but also a lot of positive ones so it's kind of making space to like understand like my hometown and like kind of be a bit of a tourist where I live because it's quite like a horror st like historical place to be honest mm. um but using photography I'm trying to like give thanks to it because obviously I'm going to move away to Japan so complete opposite end of the world and it's kind of like saying goodbye to it so it's quite emotional in a way because I keep going to like places that I used to go to as a child and the project's name is um stinging nettles right which is about um so when I was a child me and my sister and my dad always used to go out for walks in the countryside and there was one day where she was climbing across a like a metal beam and there was stinging nettles either side of it and she completely fell into the stinging nettles and then my dad like dragged her out of everything and it's like it's weird because it's like a really horrible memory but yeah. it's like got some like bittersweet kind of connection to it <laughs> so that's why i've kind of named the project stinging nettles because it's like seeing this town that has kind of like bad memories but also having like a certain amount of nostalgia connected to it and kind of love for my town to be honest yeah no that's fantastic so do you, do you think you'll how long do you see yourself being in japan i don't know everyone keeps asking me this and i'm like i'm not sure you say you just you move it away you leave it you make yeah. it sound like it's forever i don't know i think i've always been a bit of a traveler so i feel like once japan's done there might be a next place i've always kind of pictured myself like ending up in berlin because it's one of my favorite cities like even after visiting uh visiting japan i was still like you know berlin's just my favorite place i feel like it's just got such a good art scene and it's just i like it's all kind of brutalist like architecture and quite a lot of my friends live there as well which also helps so but i think the art scene in berlin is like incredible so i like oh, to surround yeah. myself with that no, <laughs> wicked yeah so we, i'm not sure if we were recording when, mm. when i mentioned um 
but I've never been abroad. Yeah. So it, have you got any recommendations for me oh, when so I many. finally, <laughs> so in terms of like creativity? Mm, well, Berlin, top of the list, because amazing like photography galleries. There's loads of cinemas, like really old fashioned ones and like independent cinemas, very big there as well. Um, what would I say next? I really, Vienna is very beautiful, like just as a city to explore. And that has an amazing art scene as well. Um, the architecture is there is just phenomenal. Like it doesn't seem like a real place just because everything is like so beautiful. Um, yeah, I definitely recommend those two. Where else? Mm, Prague. Prague's very nice in the Czech Republic. Okay. Yeah, very cheap, which is nice. <laughs> the food's very nice as well, which also helps. Oh, wicked. But that's a, it's a very beautiful place and everything's very gothic. They have like a very gothic architecture. Lots of amazing art galleries there as well. I can't remember what the name of the one I went to was called, but that was amazing because they had, I think it was about six levels of just photos, art, and then film at the top. So there's a whole kind of cinema that you could just relax in, watch films throughout the whole day. So yeah, but Europe's amazing for art. And then I went to, in Japan, so build up to go to Japan because the flight is horrendous because it's like 20 hours. Oh, <laughs> but I went to a place called Hakone and there they had uh, really amazing uh, like museums and art galleries. I didn't go to many because me and my friend only had like a couple days there. But we went to a Polar Museum and there it had like the most amazing art and it was just very enjoyable to us. And they have like a whole fancy dining experience you could have there but was a bit too expensive for me so maybe one day i'll go back <laughs> <laughs> oh interesting mm -hmm. that is noted yeah <laughs> cool um so have you um have you got any advice for someone mm. looking to get into photography mm. um and sort of hindsight okay anything that you would um recommend to somebody mm. somebody very young I would say just keep, I know it sounds obvious, but just keep taking photos because sometimes you get into these, it's like art block. You just completely don't want to take photos. Like I feel like in second year of uni, I really had that. Like I just didn't know what to take pictures of. Everything I took pictures of, I hated. I was like, I just don't, I feel like I'd kind of like lost my love of photography in that kind of moment. But I'd kept taking photos even throughout those kind of dark things. Even if it was like one photo, I'd be like, okay, I did one, that's fine. Um, so it's kind of understanding that you all have moments where you literally despise photography completely. Mm. Um, also comparison, I think is a thing that's very common now, especially with social media. I feel like even now I still get this. Um, I compare my own Instagram to someone else's who does similar photos. And I'm like, why have they got so many followers? And I haven't, it's right. like a, a mindset that I think lots of people get into now, but the thing is, with photography, your Instagram followers don't really matter. You can be a top photographer and only have like two thousand followers. Like my favorite photographer that I mentioned, she has she has a, like a good amount, but it's not as much as like the amount of work she gets. Like there yeah. are other methods of getting into the industry rather than Instagram. So I feel like that's something that definitely presses on a lot of kind of creators' minds. I do think it is becoming a major part of the industry though like reels which mm. drive me nuts because the only way you can get views on instagram is by making reels now which is basically just tiktok and the whole yeah. threads thing it's just like so many new things <laughs> yeah. keep getting added so i feel like that's quite intimidating for young photographers especially now that younger people are on their phones a lot more yeah um also what we kind of talked about earlier not needing uni Right. You, you don't really need to do that unless you really want to because doing a photography degree is definitely quite taxing on a lot of like my friends mm. I, I found like especially if you are just solely a creative like if you just want to take photos it's like perfectly fine but with the degree you're gonna have to write at least 8,000 words at the end of it which is quite painful and especially alongside the actual um, degree you have to do research journal which also is quite hard because 
you have to find artists, write up about artists, do photo shoots, write up about your photo shoot, write up about your edits. So there's still quite a lot of writing involved in that. So I think that's something to be very aware of when thinking of doing a photography degree. Um, but you might enjoy it. So if you do, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So how do you balance... Um, how do you how do you balance um your photography with mm. you just your own like personal life are they sort of yeah. very intertwined or do you do you yeah. have difficulty switching off mm, I think I do I'm always kind of thinking about what I need to do next which yeah. is one of like my little toxic traits I'd say yeah um I would say I'm very organized so I'm very like I love notion you know the classic kind of notion online right. journal thing so I just do like a little notion weekly plan of what I'm going to do for the week so I feel like organization is kind of key for balancing your photography alongside like seeing your friends like you need to have time to yourself because I think that's very important I think that's why I got really burnt out during last year because I was doing photography project but then I was seeing my friends all the time and then I was working all the time as well alongside that so then I just hit like a massive wall I think in November and I was like I'm just gonna have a little break and just kind of go traveling for a bit and then come back and then just start up again so I feel like you definitely need to step away from the camera sometimes mm. but not for too long because you might get a bit rusty <laughs> so yeah but I think it depends on the person I feel like photography is a very personal uh kind of thing like everyone works differently like in even your own in industry like not everyone's going to do the same as you would mm. it's definitely a very personal like experience so, yeah yeah mm. yeah uh, the thing i'm fi finding quite interesting mm. is you seem incredibly ambitious yeah m m just moving away to japan mm. and going on the path that you have done mm. and are going on mm. I'm I'm just interested in mm. sort of what makes you tick in yeah. a way. Mm. I mean, s some people, some people are dragged yeah. along a path, mm. and some people are pushed yeah. by by something, mm. um, and it's not always a positive thing. Mm. Um, how do you how do you feel about mm. how do you feel about that and well, I say it for myself. Um, I don't know. It's quite a good one. <laughs> I would say I've always been quite ambitious with my photography. In secondary school, I remember I got really like overly competitive with one of my like um, someone I was at school with. Like right. we'd always be in like a competition who would get higher grade than each other. I did beat her at the end, so I have to say. Oh, <laughs> so after that, I was like really competitive about it. And then after I went traveling, I kind of lost that competitive streak. And I was a bit like, why am I doing that? Like, I enjoy making photos. Like, it's something that just brings me complete joy. Like, when I do it, it just makes me happy. Like, sometimes yeah. I get really stressed out and absolutely hate my work. I'm like, oh, why did I do that? Yeah. But that's just natural of creativity. You're always going to hate something you do. Um, so I guess it's just my love for photography. And also, I enjoy film a lot as well. Like, films do influence my work quite a bit, especially Japanese films. And Wong Kar Wai, do you know Wong Kar Wai? I'm afraid I don't. Okay. He's a Hong Kong um, director. Right. And his films, like, they're very, I think they've got a bit popular because I think there was a TikTok filter right. that was meant to look like his work. And then loads of people kind of started learning about him from there. Um, so I love his um, films and how he created from that. So I'm always very inspired by things that surround me. And also I'm weirdly photography, like photographers probably inspire me the least out of everything else. I do enjoy looking at photography, but I feel like I watch a film and I'm like, oh, I've got a great idea for something now. Or I'll read a book and then I'm like, okay, that's going to kind of benefit my work more. So I feel like looking at kind of changing industries and adapting my own kind of art from others arts is something that kind of helps me keep going and also moving to Japan is quite I always tell people and they're just like what like why Japan but 
I think it's just because that has had such an influence in everything I've kind of created. Just because I've enjoyed the style that Japanese photographers, uh, photographers use. And even like literature as well. Like there's lots of Japanese novelists that I just really love. And then I'll just read their books and I'm like, okay, mm. I know what I need to kind of do now. So I think it's just having multiple... Uh, medias that you're kind of interested in not limit yourself to one um so i feel like that kind of inspires me to keep going keep making work and also allow things to change i feel like i was very before university i was always just like okay i'm gonna take photos like this because i like this photographer and then throughout university it's like i can kind of create my own style through multiple kind of media is influencing me so I guess it's finding ambition through consuming media in that way I'd say cool mm. would you say are you much of a procrastinator I can be sometimes I've been working on it I uh recently I deleted Instagram for like a month yeah just to get rid of it and then because I was just spending too much time on it I feel like it's quite common now. Like most people's screen times can be quite high now. Like mine was getting too high. And I was like, there's so many hours that I could actually be doing something else. Like yeah. Whether that's studying Japanese or <clears throat> reading or just watching films. So, and I feel like I realized once I kind of did that, my concentration level really like improved. Because yeah. I feel like through Instagram, you kind of look at something and just carry on going. So, yeah. like, my attention span was so quick. I was like, oh, I'm not interested. But then after I did that, I was a bit like, oh, actually, I will sit down and watch this entire movie without checking my phone, which yeah. I would not be able to do before. So, yeah, I feel like procrastination can be very easy, especially in our generation. But I feel like not feeling bad for it is very important, though, because right. I feel like there's this whole kind of guilt thing about being lazy. And it's like you naturally need time for yourself like if you don't want to create like work on that day that's fine like you can procrastinate for that day yeah. but if there's something important you need to get done I feel like you need to kind of like prioritize that and then relax after but even if like say if I was writing my dissertation and I was really stressed out by it I didn't really want to write so then I just sat on my phone I feel like that's kind of needed at those times. Like I feel like having a little scroll, just watching like a nice movie, hang out with your friends for a bit. I feel like it's definitely needed, just to because we're not robots at the end of the day. I yeah. just can't constantly keep going. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> do you find that you are able to do your best mm. work in particular like state of mind? Mm. Um, I think it changes for me. It used to be like in the morning was when right. I was most productive so then I'd get everything done and then 2 p.m would happen and then I'd just do nothing for the rest of the day like at university I used to do that but then I used to get up very early right so I used to wake up at six go to the gym then I'd start writing my dissertation eat lunch do in like an hour more and then just do nothing for the rest of the day because like one of my flatmates he was kind of like nocturnal so right. then I'd always hang out with him and then go to bed quite late so I feel like it definitely changes like now it's completely different. It just kind of, I feel like it happens when it happens now. Right. So like some days I just don't feel creative at all. I feel like when I was younger, I'd be like really upset when that happens. But now I'm just like, that's fine. You can have days where you just don't want to do like photography for the day. You can yeah. give yourself a break of that. Because if I forced out those photos, they're probably not going to be as good. That's true. Mm. Yeah. Now I have a real problem mm. with sort of, uh, the, the only time that I feel fulfilled mm. is when I'm working. Yeah. Um, and even if I have a day off mm. like once in a month, yeah. Like I just f I don't feel terrible. Yeah, it's like taking kind of it. anxiety, isn't it? That yeah. You've not done enough. Yeah, mm. it just feels like I'm sort of wasting the time almost. Yeah. Um, and it's it's kind of tricky. So I find I'm my most productive in hindsight mm. when my state of mind isn't very good. Yeah. So it's sort of it's sort of like like it's a little bit TMI. Mm. But I literally just got out of mm. 
a three-year relationship about eight months ago. Mm. And in hindsight, the only thing that sort of propels propels me um, is that, is that sort of negative um, Mm. state of mind that I've I've got left over from from that. Yeah, I feel like that definitely can fuel it because it was like my whole project after that kind of relationship. I feel like if I didn't have that, I don't think I would have been as successful as I was, which is kind of weird because I feel like I had this strange kind of sense that I've left him. I need to be like amazing now. Like I need to show that I'm so much better without him. So I was just working like an extreme amount. But I think that's why I literally had like a year of burnout. Yeah. Because it was just like I was working so much to the point that I was just like, okay, I need to have just two months of just going to Japan and Korea and just eating food having a good yeah. time so yeah. yeah but I feel like it definitely can help but I feel like it's knowing when that kind of mindset isn't benefiting you and it's kind of getting worse I feel like it's kind of dressing because only you know how you feel kind of like I can say I feel great but inside you're probably like oh, I'm actually really stressed right now I've got about six things I need to do after this and it kind of that can kind of fuel you but also it will lead to burnout at the end, I think. That's yeah. my personal opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So um, do you, with, with your English mm. teaching, Yeah. Um, are you doing the English teaching like purely so you can move to Japan for a bit? Like, what, um, like do you see yourself doing that long term? I think the main reason for teaching Japan is because I'd like to improve my own Japanese as well as teaching out there because I have a few of my friends and they always said their kind of English learning at school was always horrendous and they'd always have like a foreign like like I'll be an ALT so it's like assistant language teacher so I'll be helping a Japanese teacher who teaches English if that makes sense Um, but they always said that the ALT was always rubbish and it was obvious they were using it as a holiday. So right. that's what I didn't want to be. So I did a TEFL course, which is teaching English as a foreign language. So I did that after I graduated from university um, so that I would actually know how to be a good teacher for students because I recognise there'll be students don't don't care about English and that's fair enough. Um, yeah. And... I kind of want to just help the students that do want to kind of learn as well as the ones that don't want to learn because I used to hate French and then I had this really amazing French teacher and then I did actually enjoy it towards the end. So I'd kind of like to be a bit like that sort of thing. Um, But also living in uh, Japan would just be amazing as well alongside teaching. And because I'm learning Japanese, it's extremely difficult to learn it living in the UK because it's very limited people that I can speak to to practice so that's why I've kind of got a tutor now so I can actually speak it and not just kind of speak it to myself when I'm like learning it. Yeah. So that'll definitely kind of benefit me by living out there. And also my photography will work well alongside living there because there's so many things I want to capture whilst I'm there. Yeah. At Mount Fuji, which I was lucky enough to see because it's really hard to actually see it, but right. I did, which is kind of good. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Moving on a little bit. Are there any sort of misconceptions um, about sort of your style of photography that Mm. you'd like to sort of (laughs) debunk almost? I mean, to be honest, Mm. when uh, like when I looked at Mm. like your your just your Instagram Mm. example, like it was really interesting. Mm. But I think the the maybe it's just me being like super shallow yeah and I've always been like more more of my photography more of a commercial of course, photographer yeah. mm. um there was like some stuff that I sort of didn't quite mm. get like yeah. I didn't quite understand mm. I didn't quite understand um the style yeah so I don't know if you could maybe go into that a little yeah, a little bit yeah I mean, like, I've got quite a lot of friends that don't really understand my work at all. They're just like, oh, okay, like, it looks all right. Um, I guess with lomography, 
there is kind of a sense of freedom with it. So some people can use it, and this isn't a bad thing, just for fun. Like you got your Lomo camera, just shoot something that's cute and then just carry on. Um, with my own photos, I take quite a long time actually capturing them. Right. Um, so because they're like multiple layers in one, I'm very particular about what I'm going to layer on top. So if I did a building, I want to plant with it. Or I always, in my photos, I always have a tree somewhere, which is, unless I can't find a tree at the moment, but trees have always been like a main part of the kind of background of my photography. Also relates to the Shintoism that my degree project was inspired by. Um, but with Lomo, there's definitely an element to it that is very free and as you say like from a commercial photographer point of view it's just be like oh that's just like a picture of about three things in one like they haven't even thought about <laughs> what they're doing they're just doing this which can be true to be honest like some of my photos I literally just stood in the same place and just did this and then just like winded it on and just saw what happened so there's definitely an element of freedom which I think can be a bit scary mm. for like photographers if they start doing it because my photography project, my last one, when I started it, it was completely different. It was photos of trees, very high quality, and they all shot on digital. And then I had like these Lomo photos that I took alongside it just for myself, for fun. And like, I really enjoyed doing it. And I was like, okay, I'll just keep them. Like, no one's gonna wanna look at them anyway. And then I showed my lecturer and he was like, you're, you're doing those ones and I was like what I was like I just did those for fun he's like no but you like those ones you don't like these ones I was like, that's true so I guess it's just it has a sense of freedom that I enjoy with the photos and anyone can do it mm. I think that's something that people always say like oh anyone can take a picture like that but I feel like not all photos have to have a meaning behind them but mine tend to have kind of something that I'm either going through or something I'm trying to like reflect through the imagery. Um, so I guess it's trying to use experimental methods to show something that's kind of serious. And it's like my current project, which you'll probably hate, I'm using my Nintendo DSi to actually take the photos on. And like the quality of it is horrific. Um, so I'm switching everything in black and white. Right. So then it has that kind of rawness to it. Yeah. But I know people are going to be like, what the hell is that? Like you're taking a picture on a DSi. Um, but that's all about nostalgia and how I used to love taking photos on that when I was first, because that would be my first official camera, right. to be honest. It would just be a Nintendo. So I was like switching back to that and then documenting the place that I first fell in love with photography with my first camera. Mm. I feel like kind of works. So I guess... Um, as a photographer that does more artistic photos, I feel like it's knowing how to kind of not defend yourself, but also accept people aren't going to like your photos. Like I don't really like studio based photography very much. Mm. Like it's just the complete opposite of what I enjoy. Like I enjoy yeah. the whole skill behind it and actually doing it like it is fun, but I would prefer to do my weird little blurry photos any day of the week than doing that. So yeah. I guess it's just, know what you enjoy and stick to it and accept people will criticize it because photographers always criticize each other. It's just natural. Like, yeah. yeah. Anyone say, so yeah. Interesting. Mm. Um, so when it comes to um, sort of the technical stuff, mm. um, do you find it difficult to balance uh, the technical aspects and the creativity or is it very heavily leans towards creativity for you? I mean, all my images, actually, I do edit on Photoshop, even though I take on film. Oh, so I scan them all in and then I edit them on Photoshop, which oh, I know yeah. some photographers absolutely hate when you admit that, but <laughs> I just feel like... What do you do? What's the extent of which you do? <sighs> just a bit of curves, very bit of lines. Oh, right, yeah. I kind of sort of the brightness in certain areas. Like, if there's certain parts of the photo, I actually want to boost saturation and to make stand out more, because I think some of the photos I had... I think it was ginkgo leaves in it and I wanted them to really stand out so I did actually just increase the saturation on that bit and just kind of mask the rest so I feel like I enjoy 
I love using like Photoshop. I feel like that definitely is still like a huge part of my work. Um, just because even if things go wrong, you can tweak them on there. Mm. Um, and it does give you a sense of like, you can add creativity with that kind of technical aspect, like something that you kind of produce then has more added to it. So I feel like in camera is very important, but you can also enhance things. I feel mm -hmm. like if a photo is bad, then it's going to be bad when you f try to edit on Photoshop. Like That's something kind of I've learned to accept. <laughs> like sometimes I have photos and I'm like, oh, it's pretty bad. I'll see if I can do something. Yeah. It's, it's just not going to work. So, um, yeah, I feel like having a technical love kind of helps my creativity as well. Yeah. So I guess combining them. Yeah. Yeah, now I have a problem. With, I have a problem where I'm like really geeky mm. and I'll often get caught up with the gear yeah. aspect of it. Um, over creativity oh, sometimes. Okay, yeah. It becomes a bit of a problem. Mm. I feel like that's more common with like commercial photographers because I feel like a lot of it is technical based. Yeah. So then it's just like you're probably thinking about the technical side more than the actual kind of what you're capturing at the same time. Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of my friends that do more commercial style, when they speak to me, they just feel like a bit stressed out because they're like, how can you not care like what you're taking a photo of? And I was like, I do, but in a different way. <laughs> like, <laughs> I like that tree. I'm taking a picture of it. And they're like, that's just not enough. I'm like, okay. It's just different opinions, I guess. Yeah. It's just ways of working. I feel like photography is very broad as well. Yeah. Like there's so many different styles and ways you can produce work and like some people are just being photographers using their iPhones now, which I feel like some photographers from the past just absolutely are terrified of because you kind of don't need a camera. You can literally just use your phone, which is impressive to be honest. I think it is quite... I kind of welcome that kind of aspect of future of photography, like mm. moving into cameras. Like it's more accessible for people. Like not everyone can afford a really fancy DSLR or that 40,000 Fuji camera that I'm in love with. And yeah. I just think about all the time. Um, <laughs> like not everyone can get those things. Yeah. So having everyone be able to just capture things on the phone, I think it's kind of nice to be honest. Even if they're not becoming a photographer at the end of the day, they're still enjoying photos. And especially with like Instagram, I feel like photography's a main part of everyone's day now. Mm. Like even posting stories and things, you're a, kind of like a photographer doing that because you like your breakfast or whatever you're taking a picture of and posting that yeah. i know photographers will probably agree with that but yeah i think anyone can do it but yeah no absolutely mm. do you have any thoughts in terms of um sort of how technology is moving on mm -hmm. and with uh, sort of ai mm. um obviously a big thing yeah for me mm. in the film industry yeah, with true. the writer's strikes mm. going on at the moment. Yeah. Um, are you, how do you feel about that in terms of photography? AI mm. kind of creeps me out a lot. <laughs> yeah. Like I always read into it and I'm a bit like, I don't like this because it can produce anything you want. Like some parts of it, I feel like when it first started becoming a trend of people using it, everyone's like, oh, it's kind of funny. Like, you can make a Van Gogh painting out of a picture of your mum or something. Yeah. And then it's like, actually, this thing can do everything humans can do, but probably at a higher level and instantly. Mm. And so I was like, that just removes the purpose of humans, which sounds dramatic. I feel like it can be beneficial in some ways. Like, uh, I guess studying through AI. I saw, I don't know what it was. Hopefully it wasn't Elon Musk saying this. Hope not. Um, but it was like uh, using university with AI as a way of teaching students because it can get so much information so quickly. So if I had AI when using my dissertation, I could have used, like found all my sources within a day and they could have been like high quality sources. I didn't have to spend like months <laughs> just like trawling the in internet just trying to find like good sources. So in that way, it can work, but then to go back against that, then that's kind of removing the lecturer. Like, then you wouldn't need a person. So 
I think that's why it kind of worries me because you're removing humans from what I find. I feel like art is a very human thing. So I feel like removing us from that just kind of, it ruins it, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Like, because you're not, like that photo is like taken by a fake computer somewhere and it looks so real that you can't tell the difference. Yeah. But also there's a whole kind of identity thing as well. So people's, I think, I can't remember who it was, but I think it was a picture of them had been made and it was kind of like an explicit photo. So then it had been like spread and then it kept being made by oh, the AI shit. constantly. But then it was like a, like a revenge act by like an X type thing. So then it spread and then I think the work had found out and thought it was real photos. So that is terrifying because it's so easily done. Like you can just type it in and be done. Yeah. Because I know there's the whole like NFT thing before the AI thing people got scared about. And I feel like I still don't really understand the point, but I feel like they could be beneficial, but I feel like it kind of removes the fun of selling your own photos. Yeah. I never understood it, to be fair. No. Um, I just remember seeing that monkey photo and it's like a million pounds. I just, <laughs> yeah. I just didn't get it. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now, uh, do you... Do you... That's kind of a stupid question, mm. but do you um, create your work to be exhibited by an audience? Mm, I say not necessarily. I sometimes make uh, ideas for what I would do if I exhibited them so like my current project I was like think of the background so if I put like an exhibition up how would I want to show it but I'd say exhibition always comes last for me like I'd create the work and then think about the exhibition from there because it's like I think quite a lot of photographers that I appreciate they're very um free with how they kind of present things so my actual degree I just presented like all over the wall. Like I didn't put in a line as like photos are normally kind of presented, but I just felt like that worked with what I was trying to show. So I feel like exhibition is very last, not last minute, but it's not something that controls my work, I'd say. Interesting, yeah. That's fascinating. I suppose the reason why I asked that is mm. because I think the only redeeming mm. thing um in the film industry mm. is the audience's craving mm. um, something that's something that's handmade. Yeah. So for example, Christopher Nolan mm. shoots on actual celluloid film. Yeah. And a, a lot of his fans um, are in support of that mm. and really enjoy that aspect. So it's sort of, the methods used to create the art almost become yeah. part of the conceit mm. and part of the selling point. Yeah. So I suppose I'm like a little bit optimistic mm. with um, hopefully towards the end of the decade mm. that we'll see maybe a repeat um, of what we saw in the early 2000s because we had it at the 90s, yeah. um, which was sort of CGI overload. Mm. And then we had gritty reboots like casino royale and Mm. batman begins yeah because i think people were craving Mm. for something a little bit more um handmade yeah i guess that's like uh do you know wes anderson yes yeah like his new film i haven't seen that yet it's it was kind of weird at first i was like i don't really understand what this is about but i'm enjoying it but it was meant to be all about covid and then once i realized that i was like oh it all makes sense like it's really good I think some people hate it, but I feel like it's more like his older stuff. Although Bill Murray wasn't in it. I didn't like Bill Murray, so I was a bit upset. Because <laughs> he's in all of them. I was like, where is he? Um, but like his films, I feel like people definitely just go because of how he films them. Like, yeah. you, if he didn't shoot the way he shoots, it wouldn't be a Wes Anderson film at all. If he didn't do like act one and then it starts sort of thing. I feel people are like, oh, this is weird. So I guess in film, it's very... I feel like it's a bit more explicit showing that kind of style is very important. Although, f- like, photography it is as well. Like, my style is important for how I want to show things. 
because mm. I find it the best way to kind of exhibit what I want to. I guess I do want my audience to feel how I felt during those things, but I don't want to make it too obvious. I think that's a very photographer thing to say when they're like, oh, I'm not telling you what the work's about, just, <laughs> just feel the photo sort of thing. But I feel like a lot of my friends that don't like photography or don't do photography, I always like to show them my photos because they've got like no idea about technical things. They just kind of go and looking at the photos. So like one of my friends that I saw recently, I remember she told me like she loves my photos because they always make her feel calm. And I was like, oh, that's just like the best compliment. It's like, that's exactly what I want. Like I want those photos to be like the quiet photos, the nice and calm, relaxing ones. So I guess it's nice to, it's always nice to hear how your audience feels. Like even if it's bad, like I'm like, okay, I understand. Yeah. But this is how it is. <laughs> no, that's fair enough. Mm. So do you have any hobbies outside of, photography that you do that maybe help you a little bit yeah uh, I'm a painter as well so I've always been very arty so I mainly just paint plants I'm very into like kind of the natural world um I haven't done it as often just because I've been quite busy at the moment so definitely need to get back into it um the bookmaking thing which I kind of learned in university that's just always quite fun to do because I think my next project I might make into a book but not the same as this one and not 40 pages because I don't think my project kind of needs that for mm. this one. Um, so, yeah, I'll be making like a more like a zine type thing, I think, because it's a bit more accessible to people, I think. And it won't cost as much, which is always good. <laughs> um, also, I'm a keen runner. I enjoy running, which is kind of a lot of my ideas happen when I'm running, right. which is quite good because um, one of my favorite writers, actually, he wrote a book called I think it's what I talk about when I'm running and that was all about how he kind of got his ideas for his novels when he's actually running and doing marathons and things so I feel like it's it's kind of weird because it's like I'll be exercising and I'll be like oh that's a good idea I'll do that later so yeah I guess it kind of helps me it's kind of like a meditative like mm. kind of you meditate when you run I guess so you're just kind of thinking about things so yeah I guess in that aspect it kind of helps that yeah, no, uh, for, for me, I, I mm. go to the gym mm. and that is like the number one place where I find... Yeah, the, the, I feel like it the, just happens. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. And it's like not a not a place where... I suppose it, I suppose, I suppose I, I sort of savour myself now mm. a little bit where yeah, that's the one place where I can enjoy my own music yeah. or an audio book or a mm. podcast or something and it's sort of my time yeah to take out it's kind of like a little personal escape yeah <laughs> yeah and absolutely yeah mm. so painting mm. what do you paint uh mainly like flowers or still life just because i feel like in secondary school you're always kind of forced to paint those like two things but I feel like it's just kind of relaxing in that sense to do those. And it kind of works in the same way that I take photos, like just ob like observing what's around me and just trying to make art out of those. Because I paint semi-realistic, but I'm not really that keen on just keeping things exactly what they're like in real life, just because mm. I'm a bit boring. I mean, I appreciate there are realist painters and things, but for myself... I'd rather take a photo if I was going to do that sort of thing. <laughs> I yeah. think that's the kind of like opposing sides of being like a painter and a photographer. Because sometimes it's like having an argument against yourself. Because it's like, I don't want to do it like that. But then my paint, not my paintings, my photos kind of, I make them look a bit like paintings sometimes. I like a bit of like watercolour. So I, I like that kind of sense of blending things together. I think that's why my photos are so kind of merged just multiple elements in one yeah i was gonna say do you ever like combine the photography and the painting like see i want to do that but i just don't know how i tried so many times i think in second year i did a painting and photo thing but i didn't really like it that much like, i look back at it and i'm like mm. but i could see how it was kind of building onto the final project but because i kind of painted all these um really abstract 
like patterns on like cellophane and then I kind of put them in front of the camera so then it would be over the photo but then I just hated it and I was like okay this is not gonna work but then I ended up scrunching up the cellophane because I was angry and then I took pictures through that and it was all distorted and I was like okay that works better but then I didn't like the photos in the end so they didn't make the cut no <laughs> no that's fantastic yeah okay. yeah no I have um like I I used to be um part of the magic circle mm. in london yeah um and i was like really into cardistry oh, okay yeah so like i've tried to shoehorn mm. that into oh, okay. my work yeah um but again i've never mm. figured out quite how yeah i do tend to whenever i do commercial work mm. i'll sort of sometimes put a playing card oh, right okay. in the background oh, <laughs> just like a little hint and, and I, i'll submit it to the client yeah and they won't say a thing oh, really? they never know That's they'll so never funny. know <laughs> so yeah but now i've never mm. found how to combine the two mm. without it being so yeah. ob- obvious mm. um yeah because i feel like it's hard to find like the subtle way you could do it because i try to like i know you can paint on negs and stuff but i was like i don't <laughs> want to like it makes me feel a bit sad if i did that yeah because uh, i know i think i did scratch into negs once just trying to do something and i just hated it i was like i'm never gonna hurt my negs ever again <laughs> <laughs> just leave them be <laughs> um so um how this is like you can tell me to fuck off okay. if you want to <laughs> Because this is kind of like a bit mm. artsy, but yeah. how has photography mm. sort of shaped your life overall? Wow, I'd say completely. Like, because my whole route has always just been driven by photography. Like, even I did like an art diploma before I went traveling. I hated it because they made me do illustration. And I still did photography alongside it. So. Even in that aspect, like, I was doing something completely different, but I was still doing photography. And it's like, ever since I had my DSi, <laughs> yeah. I've always just had a source of creating photography. And, like, even if they weren't good photos, it's always been something that's kind of driven me to not keep going. That sounds a bit dramatic. But, like, just to create things, I think, is something I just always have enjoyed. And so... Photography is my sole way of doing that. Like, I did have a phase where I wanted to be a cinematographer. So then I created some really kind of, like, trying to be Wes Anderson films. And I was like, "Mm, no, I don't have any style for that. So then I just kind of switched back to what I enjoyed. But I think it's because sometimes in the industry, it's very easy to feel a bit lonely because male photographers are always on top which is just something that I've learned to kind of deal with. Um, Even in like university at school, you're taught mainly about male photographers. Like I feel like in secondary school, I didn't have a single female photographer introduced to me at all. In university, it was quite good because they did like a mixture of both. And they also included like trans, non-binary and like different photographers from different areas in the world. So they had kind of like, a huge wide range of photographers and I was like you just don't see that many trans photographers in like the headlines or female photographers in the headlines or anything like that just because it's so overshadowed by the male photographers but like, there definitely is like popular um film female photographers like my favorite one she is um but it's definitely oversaturated a bit which annoys me sometimes but and also in industry, I have found male photographers can be quite dismissive of female photographers just because it's just like, it's the classic you're a girl, I'm a boy type vibe, which sometimes can happen and be a bit childish. But not. I think once you stand up for yourself and know that's going to happen, you have to accept that, it's fine. Like There has been times that I've just been really kind of disheartened by it because I was like, oh, maybe... This is more kind of a male-based uh, industry. Because like, all my lecturers, lecturers themselves, they were all men. 
So then I was a bit like, oh, it's not even here as well. And even like secondary school, a male teacher. So it's always just been that. But I think that's why it's kind of important for female photographers not to get disheartened by that. And like leading back to the question, sorry, I kind of went astray. Yeah, no, <laughs> um, I feel like that's something else that drives me. I want to kind of prove that even though I am a woman, I can still take photos and enjoy making them. Even if people don't understand them, I think just making those photos is what drives me. But other like women photographers or trans photographers that aren't in the media, it's just knowing that there is a place for you, even if it feels a bit oversaturated. So that's another thing that kind of keeps me going. Why do you, like, why would you say that, um, like, what, what do you think is the reason for mm. there being, like, you know, photography mm. being dominated by men? Like, what, 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 what do you think is probably the main reason for that? Honestly, it's kind of hard to tell. I'd say, like, when you look at past photographers, most of them were male. So I feel like it was seen, like, from the start, it was kind of seen as this more male-dominated thing. So I think that might have kind of made female photographers maybe take a step back and be like, maybe this is not the profession I need to get into. So maybe that's an element of it, but it's kind of hard to tell. I wouldn't really know myself. <laughs> I'd like to know. <laughs> but yeah. But I don't think it's bad. Like, male photographers are amazing. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I feel like there needs to be a bit more space to let female voices or trans voices through just because there are amazing female photographers that don't get as many, like, views as male do. Mm. So I don't really know. It's very mm. hard to see. No, it's, in, it's interesting because it, it's the same in the film industry, obviously. Yeah. Um, like, sometimes I'll, like, I'll occasionally outsource mm. certain, like, projects that I've got going yeah. on if I'm doing something for a company. Mm. And... Um, it's like it, it it's it, it's a weird thing because mm. I don't ever as a as like a, a playing like an employer role. Mm. I, f- half the time I don't even get to see who they are. It's yeah. more of like what is that? What's their work yeah, exactly. look like? Mm. Um, but it's also an interesting thing because the cases where I do see mm. and I do, um, you know say request an interview or whatever mm. it's like predominantly men if not all men yeah so then i've got just guys to choose yeah. from mm. like i don't so, yeah. so it, is, it is an interesting thing um i think there is a lack of confidence in kind of the female side mm. like i feel like because we're kind of seen as like the smaller amount of gr- like photographers in that kind of industry I guess it's kind of like you feel a bit intimidated in some ways. Mm. I think it's getting through that because, like, after university, I just I just kept applying for places, sending my photos to places. And I think it's having that confidence in what you make is kind of what gets you ahead. Because sometimes it's like, I think in the middle, it's, yeah, second year, I kept sending my photos. And you're going to get rejections. Like, it's going to happen. But I took those rejections just like to heart so much. I was like, oh, they don't like my photos. But now I'm like, okay, next one. You just have yeah. to keep on going because not everyone's going to like your work. I think that's the thing. It's just accepting that. Like sometimes you can get a bit sad about it. Like even now I'm like, oh, I liked that photo. But okay, that's their own opinion. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, in, it's interesting because mm. there's a – it. I almost feel like a sense of mm. – um a sense of uh, as odd as it sounds where uh, as a guy mm. i almost feel like i'm at a bit of a disadvantage yeah in terms of um wanting to um i mean really what what, what i think the media gets wrong a lot is mm. trying to push for um equal outcome mm. instead of equal opportunity yeah so mm. 
having, I mean, like say, I, when I've looked at certain places mm. to work and, I, and I'm fully aware of mm. how important diversity and representation yeah. is mm. and knowing that I'm in a very male dominated industry, yeah. an employer potentially ideally looking for somebody mm. either of colour or yeah. female, mm. knowing that the 95, I'm in the 95% block yeah. and I'm like... They can miss you out there. Yeah. yeah. So, mm. I mean, it's a tricky one. I think yeah. it's probably, there's still a lot of work to be done. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely. But, um, but yeah, mm. is there anything that you'd like to add at all? Mm. Anything that you'd want to throw out, throw out? I guess thank you for like inviting me to this. Right. I've never done anything like this before, so it's quite. I was quite nervous on like the train. I was like, "What do I say? <laughs> I'm too scared." But yeah, it's no, been a very cool. enjoyable experience. So yeah, thank you. No, no worries. Um, is there anything you want to plug? Uh, I've got Instagram, H Cannon Photo. I might change the name for it soon, but I've got a main account which I always link my photo account to, which is at Heidi Can with three ends. Yeah. Cool.